Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Leonardo stage and the last slot of the evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nick Hun. He's going to be talking about accessories and getting smart beyond the handset. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, good evening. Welcome to the last slot. I hope I'm not uh, keeping you away from your beds this evening. But what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about smart health, smart energy, and also the way that the technology is starting to develop into a new area called accessories. I've spent the last 20 or 30 years working with machine to machine, um, working with smart systems and wireless, and it's been frustrating to see smart energy and smart health, some of the slowest ones that are actually moving forward. Probably helped put wireless into virtually everything from sex toys to snow plows, so it's strange that the big markets don't seem to be taking it up. So why are the reasons that we're not doing it? Well. I think there's a general acceptance that we need to concentrate on trying to find solutions, both for smart energy and for smart homes. It's a fairly trivial reason as to why do we want it. Um, everybody knows it's called climate change, and unless we do something about it, the world as we know it isn't going to be here in a couple of generations' time. So different people are looking at different ways to do it. In Europe, we're trying to make our grids more efficient. We're trying to make our homes more efficient. We're trying to reduce the amount of energy we're using. We're seeing the same thing over in the States, but we've still got the issue that countries like China are committed to building something like 400,000 megawatt of generating capacity with coal. So we need to find ways to change the way we use energy to make that more efficient. That's one side of the equation. The other is, why do we need smart health? Well, smart health's a little bit different. That isn't actually so much to do with how we're changing our environment, but how we're actually getting better at staying alive. The graph here is an interesting one because this is t taken from some stats for population in Scotland. Scotland's a nice example. It also gives me a chance to, to make a couple of snide jokes about uh, devolution later on. What this does is it cuts the population down into five-year bands to say how many men, how many women are alive in each of those age bands. And this was back in 1911, before we started to get antibiotics, before we got the sulfonamides that helped um, proving the problems of death in childbirth. And you see very much a cone of population. Lots and lots of kids, but most of those kids died before they got to be the 30 or 40, and very few people living longer. Jump forward 100 years, and that's changed massively. We now have a situation where we have fewer people under 30, quite a large bulk of those who have stayed alive, but an increasing number of people living even longer. And move forward another 20 years to the projections in 2031, and we start to see almost a straight column with the same number of people at every age level. We're actually getting to the point that fewer people are now being born than you need to replenish the numbers. So that by 2031, Scotland's population will have had decreased. Now that's interesting just for demographics, but when you look at what that means for costs in the population, it becomes very worrying. If we go back to um, 1911, the red square is basically showing those people that are out at work and paying tax. It's kids from about 12, because at that point you would kick them out off to work, up until 65. Now, when the pensionable age was set at 65 by Bismarck back in the 1880s, life expectancy was 66. Um, so it was very affordable. The people in the green square are the ones that are actually paying for. But go forward, and we now see you've got a far smaller number of people having to pay for people that are staying alive longer by 2031, it becomes even more excessive. Now, the other bad bit of news about this is, as healthcare's got better, as we live longer, we don't live long healthily. For every decade, we gain an extra couple of years of extended life, but only 70% of that is well. The rest of that 30%, we are actually unwell needing medical treatment. So the costs of healthcare are ballooning. And unless we start to either kill off the old people, have lots more kids say we're going to have massive immigration, the numbers don't match. So we have to find ways to try and keep people healthier, longer, in their homes longer, to try and make it possible to just fund real retirement of a growing population. Um, and with Scotland, it's got some of the worth health problems, so perhaps not surprising in the land of deep-fried Mars bars and Greggs. 
And what everybody thinks is going to solve the solution is this great Internet of Things. Um, the Internet of Things isn't necessarily anything new. We've known about it for a long time. And it's all about having lots and lots of sensors that can capture information, send that information off so that we can do something with it. It goes into products like these, into products you've been seeing all day. And the growth of smartphones has meant we now have very small, very low power sensors at incredibly affordable prices. We can measure where you are, where you're moving, what your acceleration is, how high up you are. We're starting to get biochemical sensors that can even start to measure some of the chemicals around the body. And they're cheap, they're easy to use. And what that does is generate lots and lots of data. So the task for the Internet of Things is getting that data from the sensors, getting that back into a form where we can mash it together and analyze it, and try and get some real value out of what comes from it. So why haven't we got there? We've been talking about smart homes for quite a time. Going to sort of briefly, hopefully, let you, you indulge me in going back for a history lesson of where we are with smart homes. The first evidence I can see of a smart home was back in 1950 when Motorola built five automated homes. They built them near their facility in Phoenix in Arizona, and they weren't very automated. I mean, this was their picture of them. They had automatic machines to, or motors to draw the curtains. The lights came on automatically. And they said, in five years, every new house in the America will be built like this. Um, 60 years later, we're still working. And the industry has an interesting trick when this happens. And what that trick is, is basically you keep on changing the name of what you're doing until hopefully one day it catches on. So we started off with automated homes. Um, then we had robotic homes in the 70s. Everybody was going to have a robot that would go down and do all the housework for you. We got to intelligent homes after that, when the AI um, movement was up there. Connected homes came in as we started to lay cables down. Um, companies like Orange and O2 have built little demonstration groups of homes around the world. Then they became internet homes, when we all got internet, and everything was going to be controlled by the internet. Now we have smart homes. Um, I wonder when we're going to build any of them, because we are still not building this intelligence into homes. We're making homes more energy efficient, but we're still effectively building the same homes that we look after. Um, one of the issues with it, and this is a graphic from Parks Associates, one of the analysts that looks at this area, is there are lots of different elements to a smart home, and they're actually owned by different companies that will provide the service. Um, it's very neat the way the color coding here. So things to do with energy supply, like electric vehicles, as and when we get them, solar generation, smart meters, are owned by a utility. Um, things like putting broadband into a home, entertainment, comes from another supplier. We see burglar alarms, door openers, sensors, yet another different supplier. Um, and then the whole of your heating and lighting control tends to be put in when somebody builds the home. So we've got lots of disparate companies looking at parts of that smart home, but they're not coming together. And the interesting thing of that is for any business model, you need to say, well, who does this benefit? And if you look at the smart home, there are lots of different companies that benefit, but no one real winner. The argument is that consumers will get lower bills because the home's more efficient, it's clever. Um, it also probably means we'll have to go home to be network managers, which to me isn't much of an advantage. Um, energy providers, it means that they need to spend less on generation if they can understand when you're using energy and try and persuade you to switch things off or more at certain times because that evens out the amount of energy they need to supply you. So they like that concept and they like the concept of being able to automatically work out how much they charge you. Telcos, the network operators, like the idea of spending more services for you. So all of the companies like Sky, like TalkTalk, Talk, like the network providers here, see a benefit for them if they can get hold of part of that. And of course, all the companies that make the devices want you to buy more devices. That's hardware for them. And the retailers as well think it'll bring you into the store, you'll buy more stuff. If it's all compatible, then you'll buy the extra things. Lots of people want us to do it, but they've all got such conflicting different models. It's been very difficult to get anybody to come together even to agree a, a standard that we build these things on. We have Zigbee, we have Z-Wave, we have Wi-Fi, we have vast numbers of standards, none of which work with each other. Having said which, because of the climate change issue, the governments are pushing vast amounts of money into smart energy. The US stimulus program put about $85 billion 
into the grid and into smart meters. The UK, we're probably going to spend about £20 billion rolling out our smart meters. Um, that's the actual cost. It's about double what's being estimated at the moment, but the prices are going up year by year. Um, and all of this is an approach that's very much government-led, it's owned by utilities, and a lot of it is about utilities having more control over us than actually letting us have better control over our homes. And if we look around the world, we can see everywhere is starting to install smart meters. Um, it makes it easier for an electricity company to see how much energy we've used and how to charge us for it. It's claimed it will make us more energy conscious, so we will change the way we use energy. That's not proven. Um, but the problem even with that is it doesn't drive a smart home. And one of the reasons, as I've said, we've seen these different domains, different companies own different parts of the system. And if you look at that, you start to see where the problem comes from. Um, before I start on that, though, I ought to do a little bit about terminology. There has probably never been a word so misused in the history of English as the word smart. Um, if I look around the people here and I say, what do you understand by smart? You are probably going to think of something like that. If you go into a utility and say, what do you think of as smart? they will probably think of something like that. There is a vast mismatch in the understanding of technology, of data, and what the pair of those can do. And that's where you get this first domain of the stuff that governments are subsidizing, that utilities are forcing on us, and it's all about smart meters they can put in the home. You might get a display thrown in for free with it. <coughs> There's a gateway that goes through their own network they don't want to use your broadband because they don't want you to turn it off. And the reason they don't want you to turn it off is that meter is the only way they can bill you. So it's vital to them. They own the meter. They own the comms network to the meter. And they really don't want you to go anywhere near it in case you hack it. Um, so that's where all the money is going in smart metering. And it doesn't really help us get to the smart home. The bit that would be useful, and companies like Nest in the States are doing this with their smart thermostats, is trying to make our energy use more efficient. Most of us have a thermostat put in when we first buy the house, or the hence central heating's put in. It's set up once by the installer. It's probably never adjusted again. And most of the time, that's heating the house, or in the States, it's air conditioning the house when nobody's there. It is a lot more efficient if you can control it, but it's expensive to install that. So although we have really nice products like the Nest, the Nest smart thermostat is a beautifully designed product, but it's expensive. It's aiming at a very small segment <coughs> of the population. And it's a market that it's difficult to get people to upgrade what they have rather than putting in when you build a new home. And then finally, we have smart appliances. We've all heard about the internet fridge. Um, we've all probably thought, why the hell does anybody need an internet fridge? And I still don't know the answer to that. But manufacturers are betraying or they're being courted by utilities who say, can you make your equipment connect to us so that we can turn it off for the customer when there's a peak load? Um, that's particularly true for things like air conditioning. In the States, it's also true for things like pool pumps. But in general, we don't want it. We want to use appliances when we want them. And we don't buy them very often anyway. There are very few people that will change their fridge every year just to match the, whatever is the fashionable color. We tend to leave them until we buy a new one. And then we put the old inefficient fridge in the garage to store the beer, um, which uses even more energy because the garage is hotter. So those don't come together very well. It's one of the reasons that smart energy and smart homes haven't worked. But that's not the only disappointing area. The other one that is really disappointing is smart health, because it ought to be easier, it ought to be personal, and the reality is it's not doing much better. We see exactly the same thing happening. The very first remote health systems are about 50 years old. Um, they were effectively simple signs that elderly people put in the window that lit up saying help. Um, it worked. And we started off saying, yes, we'll call it remote health. Uh, it then went on to be telecare at the point when people realized there was a growing problem of um, elderly people living alone. It became telehealth around 2000 when people worked out how to connect modems up to make it uh, remote. Then we had e-health um, as the internet got in. Um, M-health, I'm not sure whether it was Vodafone or O2 that actually came up with that one when M-health was going to 
basically doctor to the world on our phones. And none of those have really caught on. The good thing is, as we've seen from the previous presentation, what has caught on is sports and fitness. Those cheap sensors that we talked about for the Internet of Things have started to come down in price to the point you can put them into wearable things that we just go out and buy. Now, they're aimed at sports and fitness. Um, as Adidas said when somebody questioned it, can you use it for health? The sports and fitness companies are saying no. They don't want it to be a, a medical product because there's an awful lot of regulations you have to go through to sell a medical product. But people are starting to do it. Um, I wear it's late. Let's see if anybody's awake. Do any of you wear one of these? Ah, we have one. Um, just out of interest, do you wear it all the time? No, yeah. Because a surprising number of people, about 30%, will wear these products 24 hours a day. Um, that gets very interesting. Um, one other interesting thing about these, and it's just to pick up a point from the previous Adidas speaker, Adidas said that when they were designing their system, they wanted to make it better than any other. It's very interesting if you talk to all three of the design teams in these companies, they didn't quite know what the product was going to do when they designed it. They realized they could put sensors in, and they just thought, let's make it and see what you can do with it. Now, that evolved quite rapidly, but this was far more about that serendipity of what can you do with new technology. And what they do is they generate vast amounts of data. One of the interesting things about data is you can often find a lot of stuff out from data that you didn't necessarily think was there. So we have people out there wearing these fitness bands. And they're actually causing some real problems to the sports companies that are supplying them because these companies over the past few decades have done lots of focus group studies. They've asked people, when do you go running? What do you do? And they now have real data. And that's showing when people actually do go running, which most of the time isn't when they thought people went running, um, nor how often they do it. And it's giving them the dilemma of, do they say, well, we've been lying to you for years, we've now got this new data, or do they try and say, oh, look, obviously, personal behavior's changed now you've got these things. But for the first time, we are getting real data to find out what you're doing. And it finds out an awful lot of what you're doing. Um, talking to one of those companies with people who are wearing them all the day, you actually know when somebody's having sex. Uh, you also know whether or not they're having it with themselves or somebody else. Um, and if you have both people wearing these, you know who they're having sex with. Raises the interesting prospect that you could actually use some of these wristbands in a paternity test case to say who was there at the time. These are things the sports companies don't want to know. Um, we can see how often you go to the toilet, so we can find out or get an indication if you have a prostate problem. We know whether you're male or female. I mean, regardless of whether you've told us, if you've got apps on your phone today, the accelerometer is probably measuring the way you walk. If you have the phone in your pocket and you're a man, it's different from if you have the phone in the handbag. Games developers already use that to actually tune the games for women or men who are playing them. Um, there's a lot of information you don't realize is coming out. Now, the problem I have here is if I do that and see you have a prostate problem and you've just bought this as a sports device, do I have a responsibility to tell you and go and see your doctor? And there's lots of issues like that in the data that are coming out. Um, I've been working for the past three years with a company in smart energy, and we're taking energy readings off meters. We've got something like four trillion readings, and we found an interesting one. We're doing some work on a TSB project looking at what can we find out about elderly people who are living alone? Now, if you're elderly and you're living alone, you probably do things to a very, very set routine. Um, in particular, you will make breakfast and you'll make your cup of teas at the same time every day. If that starts to change, it generally means there's probably a slight change of memory loss. And that's almost certainly caused at that age by a urinary tract infection. Um, we can pick that up earlier than a carer can, because when somebody's talking to a carer, they, they suddenly, the conversation sort of gets the memory back. But if it's not detected, once you've started to get that memory loss from a urinary tract infection, you're likely to have a fall and be admitted into hospital. Um, so we're finding we can pick that up just by looking at readings off an electricity meter. Things that you wouldn't think you can find. And the more data you get, uh, the more you can pull together 
it is really quite surprising what you can find out. If you're a data scientist and if you like storytelling, if you can pull those two things together, you are set up with a career. Um, London's a really good place because surprisingly, London's one of the few places in the world where you see all of the different areas of data science, whether that's in retail or financial, whether it's in physics, biology, um, energy, even in social media. All of those industries are actually in the same place in London. Go to the states that are all dispersed. Some are West Coast, some are East Coast, um, others are down in Washington. Um, it's a really good place if you want to set up a data analysis company, but that's an aside. The problem with going into real health is that there are an awful lot of barriers to it. One of the biggest barriers is the medical profession who look at all of these products coming out and thinking they are actually taking away our livelihood. Um, a lot of doctors and consultants spent a long time training. It's a very old medieval profession. Um, and both in the States and the UK, associations like the BMA, or the American Medical Association, are actually lobbying to try and increase regulation on these devices to prevent them being sold. They don't want to rock the boat that's making them a lot of money. But there is some good news. Um, you may or may not have come across it. Um, the XPRIZE Foundation puts up prizes for interesting developments. And recently, in association with Coldcom, they've put up a $10 million prize for somebody to develop the equivalent of StarTex Tricorder, a portable device that will diagnose a large number of common illnesses. And there's about 300 teams around the world have registered to do this. Um, it's a really difficult project. They're looking at saying, we want to be able to find out five basic signs, um, blood pressure, ECGs, your temperature, um, SpO2, and your respiratory rate. Within that competition, there's a core set of 15 diseases you want to be able to determine, uh, one of which is absence of disease. And that's important that you can be able to say, no, somebody's right. And then another list of really difficult ones, and you have to do three of those. Now, nobody knows whether anybody is going to come up with that. But there's some incredibly innovative stuff going on um, to see how to do that. Um, and that's ranging from both sensors to just looking at video. We now have cameras on phones are actually accurate enough that you can detect pulse rate and respiration just through the change of color of capillaries in your face. Um, it's amazing what you can start to do with this technology. And that's due to come up in three years. I think the 300 teams, some will drop out, some will combine together. If that product comes out, it probably won't be legal to sell it in the US or the UK because of regulation but I think it'll go down a storm in the Far East. So people are doing that. And the other thing that's really leading innovation are some of the crowdfunding. If we look at what's happening on Kickstarter and Indiegogo, one company, Scanadu, is one of the competitors for the Tricorder Prize. They've raised just over one and a half million dollars to fund their attempt to win that prize. But we've seen other ones like the Pebble Watch. Um, we've seen games consoles where people are actually getting multiple millions of dollars of crowdfunding to source very, very innovative projects. Some are open source, some aren't open source, but it's a way that people can do things in a similar way that apps developers could just go and do something. But what's also interesting there is it's not just big projects. Um, what I'm seeing happening is an area that's being called accessories. Uh, it's being called accessories because these are products that interact with our smartphones and interact with our tablets um, to do interesting things. Most of them based around um, Bluetooth Smart. What's interesting about these is they all do one thing. If we look at what we do when we're writing apps, when we're interacting with the smartphones, that's about as far as we get. <laughs> we touch the phone, we stroke the phone, it's very nice, we like it. But None of that interaction, none of that measurement goes beyond the phone. What accessories do is to say, I'm going to make a device with a sensor in that intimately talks to an app on your phone. And by doing that, I can both give you an interesting experience for that product um, by connecting your sensors up to an app on the phone and can send it back. Um, and I can then look at how I take that data onto a web service where I can start to do some hardcore data analysis or combine it. Um, it's opening up a whole new area of the things that we carry with us can now be very easily connected. 
Um, people are also working on little gateway devices that you just plug into a Wi-Fi router. So when you're out of the home, if you've got smart home products, they can continue talking to it. A little bit about Bluetooth Smart. If you haven't come across Bluetooth Smart, it used to be called Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, don't think about Bluetooth. Um, within the Bluetooth community, the standards group spent about four years trying to say, can we make a low power version of Bluetooth? And at the end of those four years, they basically said, no, you can't. We need to get a blank sheet of paper out and make something that's new. The clever thing is they designed something that could fit into the same Bluetooth chip within your mobile phone, so your phone supports both of them. And the basic question is, well, if we want to enable this Internet of Devices, what do you need to do? Well, you want to make things that are low power so they can run off coins. You obviously want to make devices that can easily connect to the web. Um, devices that can broadcast information out so you can just strew them everywhere and things can pick things up. And um, that's useful for things like indoor location. And obviously they want to connect to the mobile phones you have so you don't need to pay any more money for something to connect them to. And the interesting thing in that blank paper exercise was discover that there aren't actually any existing standards that do that. And that's one of the reasons that Bluetooth Smart was put together as that new standard. Um, and it's low cost, it's low power. If you have an iPhone 5, if you have a recent iPad, if you have a recent Android, it's included in that. You may not know it's there yet, but it's there. APIs have been published for people to actually develop with it. Um, around 87% of current or projects over the last um, nine months that have gone on to Kickstarter that use wireless now use Bluetooth Smart as that wireless. Um, I'm going to skim very quickly through a couple of the techie slides. Come and catch me afterwards if you want to talk about this for the rest of the evening. Um, it's a very <coughs> asymmetric standard, so you can make stuff that's really low power, that spends most of its life asleep, um, just wakes up when it needs to do something. Um, and you can also have the client, which is the, the phone, um, which then talks to it, configures it, sets up any states machines, and receives data. Um, the server bit, which is what you can put on the same chip that is your sensor, is what you build into all of your devices, and we'll show you some in a sec, um, that make this really exciting. It's a standard that's not about sending streams of data. Um, if somebody asks you what's a data rate, that's the wrong question. It's all about state. It's about those little bits of What's your name? How old are you? What's your temperature? What's your blood pressure? Which way do you want to turn? Where am I? Things that you can read at a regular basis when you need to, but it's about those little snippets of data, and it's all about individual bits of data. So it's things like your thermostat of what's the temperature? Sorry, you could set it remotely. How many far have I walked? Um, trivial ones, you can actually put in a stapler. How many staples have I got left? How many pages have I stapled? Look at office productivity. Um, pill boxes for the elderly, just checking, have you opened it? Have you taken your daily pill? Um, burglar alarms, house alarms. <coughs> your house has just been burgled, it's caught fire, whatever. And all of the things that you build into smart clothing. Those are the obvious applications, and those are the things that I think all of us in the community thought, these are the things people will go out and build and they are going out and building them. But they're building lots more fun ones that we hadn't thought about. You can bow and find little stick and finds. They're about the size of a 2p coin. Um, they've got a little buzzer in, and they just put them on things that you regularly use, like your keys or your remote control. And then when you can't find it, you just run the app on your smartphone, and it will tell you how far away it is. So you can use that to find stuff that's lost. Um, you can buy them today. They're fun. Um, Parrot, we mostly know Parrot from all of the nice drones they have, but they've made this for people to put in their pot plants, and it will tell you what the pH of the water is and whether it needs watering, and alert you on your phone when you need to go and water your tomatoes. Um, we have lots of people that are doing cuddly toys that interact with um, applications or books or tell stories, all of the things for kids. There's all of the hug me devices so that you can remotely hug somebody by sending a message to their phone which then goes and hugs them. Um, and the one I really love, there's a company called Power Up Toys that currently make a little electric motor for a paper plane. You just fold up a paper plane the way you always folded up paper planes and clip it on and it flies. And they're just about to bring one out that's got Bluetooth Smart in it so you can actually control your paper plane by wiggling your phone around. I think that's cool and I want one for Christmas. Um, 
and we're seeing innovation where people are thinking, how do you do other stuff? Um, and this is one of the areas I've been looking at. If you're looking at assisted living and how do you help elderly people in the home, you can put sensors in all sorts of things. So we can put them either into doorknobs or to the flushing um, handle on a loo. You can put it into remote control. Think of putting sensors into the things that people use rather than trying to make a new device for them. You can put sensors into toothbrush. I would love to see a glucose sensor and a toothbrush for diabetics. Um, and the important thing about all of this is if you're making a product that's going to be medical, it doesn't have to be white with red buttons. Um, you would be amazed how few people realize that you can actually make colored products. Um, nice instance there is the fall alarms which people have are almost all bought by procurement managers of the NHS who insist they have to be white with a red button. 30% of people refuse to wear them because they're white with a red button and they just think it's a badge of disability. There's some really simple things we can do by thinking about colors. Um, just on the toothbrush, there is already a Bluetooth toothbrush out there that actually monitors how often your child is brushing their teeth and for how long and sends that to your phone. Um, there's another nice app, this isn't a, a Bluetooth one, that you now get over in Japan where you have a little video screen to go that also acts as a bathroom mirror and it has a cartoon character that monitors what the child's doing and if they're not brushing long enough it keeps on trying to brush the teeth more to persuade the child to do it. There's lots of really fun innovation going on that we can now do. Um, so that's out there, it's happening and it's all about generating data that you can use to then do something interesting with. Um, we're seeing lots of stuff happening out there on the crowd-funded ones. We're seeing lots of people with little startups just saying, let's try this. Um, the interesting thing is it's very, very easy to actually get in and try and design these products. You can get, if you're designing hardware, and I'm aware I'm talking to an audience that mostly isn't designing hardware, but you probably know people who are, you can get the dev kits for this for around about $100. Um, there's lots of companies down at the bottom that do those. Um, there are published apps for Apple and Android. You can even get a basic program that runs on an iPad that lets you program in basic um, if you're as old and uh, sort of as programming unfriendly as I am um, that is out there and that works. You can buy modules that have got embedded basic in. There's lots of people trying to make this easy and in volume the cost of these chips which includes all of the radio, all of the protocol stack and an ARM processor to write your app on aren't much more than a dollar. You really are getting the point you can make disposable stuff. And these products are effect attracting crowdfunding. They are being successful. Um, one interesting thing, though, you should say if you're going out and you're making products, think of what your channel is. Um, one worry I have with a lot of the crowdsourced products is people are going to make it, they're going to supply them to all of the original people who invested in it, and then they aren't necessarily to know what to do. Um, a nice example here with smart homes. In the US, most companies trying to sell smart home products are trying to sell them through the people that sell and maintain burglar alarms. Now that's quite a good route because in the States about 30% of houses have burglar alarms. If you go over to Germany, it's not a very different level of burglary. It's about 60% of the level in the States. But only 24% of German homes have burglar alarms. There are some very, very different national tendencies. And if we look at channels to market for anything that has a data return, you need to be aware of what it is. So make sure you understand your market and be aware that markets vary as you go country to country. Um, one of the other ones is understand your customer. I was amazed, I was at a smart energy conference over in the States at the beginning of this year and the CEO of one of the major utilities, and I won't shame them by saying which one, said the best thing that they thought had come out of smart meters is it gave them evidence to blame the customer whenever the customer contested the bill. Um, for them, the customer for smart meters was the billing department within the utility. Uh, make sure you understand you know who your real customer is. Um, because often understanding your customer is more important about understanding your technology. So I'm hoping that with these things, we are finally going to see a move into getting products out there that are disruptive and go in and start to change both the smart energy and the smart home and also the smart health market. But it's up to you to go out and innovate. And if you fail on those, you've still got cats, pets and kids to try to sell to. That's it for me. Um, 
I've written a book. I have a blog with lots of stuff in. I haven't got a Facebook page because I'm just too easily distracted by stuff like that. Um, so feel free to go and pull any of that down. Go and apply some of this. Have fun. Think about stuff. It's cheaper than it's ever been to actually develop products or persuade somebody to develop products for you. Um, and we really want to see disruption in hardware of the form that we've seen of disruption in apps. So thank you. Yes, please, questions. Okay, um, we heard a lot about the possibilities. Um, what about the possible problems that might come up? Uh, the robustness, the hackability, and stuff like that. Yep. Um, one of the things that I try to impress on people if you're starting to design connected products is as soon as you got really past your first pass at architecture of end-to-end, -end, do a security model understand what data you are generating, where that data is going to, and how that data is protected. Um, far too many systems that are out on the market um, don't actually think that through. They'll say, oh, I'm using Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is protected data. Well, that only secures the link from your Wi-Fi to your router, at which point it's not protected. Um, it's the simple things of just make sure that you've got that same level of protection. There's th this great thing of people saying, I read a data sheet somewhere and it says it's AES128, so that must mean everything's protected. It's not. Um, understand what you're doing. Just follow best practice. I mean, make sure you're using salted hashes on passwords, on servers. It's the things that aren't that difficult if you think about them at the beginning, um, but if you try and bolt them on afterwards, and an awful lot of systems out there, people design bits as individual bits and then try and bolt them together. Those are the ones that's a nightmare. Always assume that hackers will break stuff. Um, within the Bluetooth community, we actually encourage hackers to come in and try and break everything as we're writing the specs. Um, now, I'm not saying that people won't hack into stuff. They will. That's the nature of the hacker. Everything that we've got out there that we've said secure so far tends to get broken. But be aware of it, try and make sure you can upgrade your products, but understand the risks. Um, there's a real issue with security that if you make something ultra secure, it's almost unusable for a consumer. Um, and you have to understand that balance. The other bit that sort of comes outside that security, which I've alluded to, is you may discover that you can tell things or mine information out of your data, which is actually quite scary for your business to handle. And you then need to think about how do you protect that data and how do you sometimes just say, that's where I stop. And are we sure it's got enough reliability for, like for a kid's toy, that's, it doesn't matter if it <coughs> fails one time in 50, but for medical yep. applications, we expect it to work perfectly every time. Is, is it that going to be that reliable or are there some problems to overcome? Um, wireless is not 100% reliable. You can interfere with wireless and that's true of any wireless standard that we have today. Um, Bluetooth, um, Wi-Fi have worked closely with the Continua Health Alliance, which writes medical specs in the States. Um, those have produced products that have gone through FDA certification. Uh, now, against which we've recently seen cases of glucose pumps and defibrillators that have also been through FDA approval being hacked. Um, one of the, the critical things, I think, is manufacturers of those sorts of medical products need to be aware of these problems. They've been very blasé about it in the past and thinking, well, why would anybody want to hack a defibrillator? Well, because you can. Um, and you have to accept that people will, so you need to look at best practice. Um, where possible on medical devices, you also want to fail safe limp home mode, so if it detects anything, it goes on working safely while it alerts somebody to the problem. Um, but, I mean, part of this is, I think, all of this, the standards out there, whether they're wireless or wired, try to give you the best toolkit. Uh, it's up to developers to make sure they implement it, and then also up to standards and the, the market in general to be open where something goes wrong, to share that knowledge and not just try and hide it. Um, medicine should be evidence-based, and that should be equally true of, of how products run. Sadly, most medicine isn't evidence-based yet. Mm-hmm.
<coughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, is the market for, uh, is the, are there many businesses that are, that are involved in producing this type of products? I mean, uh, is it hard to get on the market at th this point of time? <coughs> at the moment, there's a small number that are shipping the products. Um, we've, I think, saw the first product shipping from some of the big name sports companies at the beginning of this year. Um, we then had a, quite a large number of startups. We've got the crowd-funded ones. Some of those are already shipping products. Um, within Bluetooth, you have to qualify a product. You have to go through a certification process before it goes on the market. I'm aware of a backlog of hundreds of those products that have registered as going to be ready in the next sort of three to six months. So it is an accelerating trend. But having said that, it is very early in the cycle. Um, up until a few weeks ago, the stack was only available on iPhone 5 and the, the recent iPads. Um, it's now out for Android. The next tranche of Android phones that are coming out will have the APIs in that. Um, so all of that should hopefully form the virtuous circle and see it accelerate. Hi there. Yeah, Nick, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask, you know, there's a, a lot of media coverage around uh, Kickstarter and, and mm. you know, that as a source uh, for funding. Um, is, it, is it true, like, is a lot of the innovation coming from that space? Or, you know, is it something that the government's involved, uh, involved with as well? I'm, I'm kind of after trying to understand why it's down to the crowd to fund this type of thing if the benefits are so big. Potential um, benefits. Yeah. Um, we have some of the big companies involved, as I say, the sports and fitness ones are one of the earliest ones to, to jump onto this. Um, that's in part because they have been using either proprietary standards or they were using Ant. Um, Ant has an issue that it's owned by Garmin, which is a competitor to a lot of the sports companies. So they very rapidly rushed in and tried to get product out and they got expertise. Um, with all hardware, it's surprising how long once the technology is there to enable it, it is before you get products on market. Um, what Kickstarter has done is really started getting product being innovated and churning very rapidly. Um, there's a couple of manufacturing companies that are, are sitting in the States and over in China that are also specializing in supporting Kickstarter projects to say, you give us the design, we can get it to market in the first thousands, ten thousands literally in three months, whereas traditionally a product cycle would have been about nine months. So we're seeing that initial level. What I'm now seeing is some large companies showing interest, and they're taking one of two approaches. They're either saying, we've got the resources, we're going to copy it, and then we're just going to wipe these people out. Or in one or two cases, they're saying, we're going to buy these crowdsource projects and use those people to design products for us. Um, so it really is an acceleration of hardware design that I don't think we've ever seen before. Um, now, how that will come out, because there's the issue that quite a lot of the Kickstarter projects may never actually deliver working products to their customers. And I think a lot of people that invest in crowdfunded ones think that they're buying a product that exists. They're buying the promise of a product. Um, and it will be interesting as we go sort of six, 12 months in, if some of them fail to deliver on time, whether they will keep happening. But then if you look at the Fitbit story, I mean, Fitbit was a startup. It said it was going to have product in six months, and it took orders for it. And then it took them two years to develop it because they realized how difficult it actually was. They did a wonderful job of keeping those early purchasers on board. Um, and I think almost all of them were happy and talked the story up. And Fitbit's now a real success. So if you work with your customers, and that's something else that small companies are doing in ways that have never been done before, you do have this ability to take them on the journey with you, even if you have some bumps in it. Thank you all in that case, and uh, let me not keep you from your beds. <laughs>